The Lord is my shepherd, the foundation of this whole psalm. I just pray that we will keep growing as a church individually and corporately to behold the, the depth and the beauty and the infinitude of that statement. The Lord is my shepherd. I am in his fold. He is caring for me the way that we have been learning. Therefore, I shall not want. I have everything that I need if God is my shepherd. David then flushes out that beautiful statement in detail. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He, he, he did what John just testified to. He took away all those fears and little anxieties of day-to-day -day living and planning and organizing, and now he's just sitting in green pastures delighting in God. He leads me beside still waters. He will, he'll lead me to that place where I can drink of the living Christ. I get tipped over and, and, and cast, and he restores my soul again and again in the Christian life. Every time I, I get depressed and discouraged and, and wanting to, to give up, he comes and he restores me again. He leads me into the paths of righteousness. I will keep walking. I love John's testimony. He just kept walking in that same wrong path again and again, and the good shepherd gave him a heart attack and all of these things, and now is leading him in the paths of righteousness. And last week we learned that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I feel no, fear no evil, for thou art with me. He'll take me and he'll lead me into the valleys to bring me to higher ground, to behold more of him and know him deeper. And as John shared, I, I go from you do this, he shall, he shall. He leads me into green pastures to you, God. Uh, there's an intimacy, there's a oneness, there's deeper communion with God in the valley. And so you must go into the valley if you'll ever go to the higher places. And so I want to become a people who embrace the valleys and we don't run from them because he'll be with us. He will come, he will be with us in every one of these trials. And, and let's be a people who embrace them and receive and go and grow with the good shepherd in all those places. And in that greatest fear of even death, of the place where no human can go with us, the good shepherd will take your hand and he'll lead you safely home into your eternal fold with God forever. That is the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray as we will now learn even more what the good shepherd does in caring for his sheep. Don't you just love being in the sheepfold of God? This is a beautiful thing. I pray that all of us treasure the beauty of being in God's fold. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the beauty of what we've been learning in Psalm 23, I don't want to just learn this academically, God. I want to understand this, but I want to behold the shepherd. I, I want to lay down in green pastures, Lord. I don't want to live uh, anxious and skittish. Lord, I pray that, that you being our shepherd would change and transform every life in this place. God, don't let us be those who live in the day and age of anxiety. God, let us be a people of peace. A people who, who, when it's swirling all around us, have this calm and contentedness because we know our shepherd and we hear your voice. God, you have come to give us abundant life in you. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit would keep doing that work in every one of our hearts and that you would meet us here this morning in the word of God. And that would be the fruit that would come forth from our time together of worship in this word. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Psalm 23, we began looking in verse 4 last week. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. And that's where we left off, and this morning we'll finish up. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so last week we saw at the beginning of the summer months that the shepherd would begin his ascent up into the mountains for the dry, hot season. And as they went to higher ground, the shepherd would carry a very uh, minimum amount of uh, equipment. You would take the barest of essentials, uh, very much like when you go camping. You, you, you don't take the whole house. Some of you, I, I've seen you got the BMW of campers. But for the most part, you go with very bare essentials when you go camping. A shepherd would usually, in certain areas, would carry a rifle and, and a staff in their right hand. And they would, they would have these little shepherd shacks up there for the summer. And so in the morning, they would make a small knapsack with their lunch and water and some first aid remedies for the flock if something happened. In the Middle East, and, uh, most of them would carry then a rod and a staff. 
in Africa, the, uh, Keller, who was a shepherd, where I've been leading and sharing from his book, is he said you would carry this long, slender stick, which was known as a knob carry. I actually have one of these, and I had it sitting next to my computer to bring this morning to show you. I, it was a gift from the Maasai Mara tribe that they gave to me, and it, it's just this amazing little stick with a big club at the end of it. So your rod, a rod wasn't just something that you would hit someone with, you, you could also throw it. So it was something that you could club somebody with, or if you needed to hit Kendall right here, you go, boom, and it would just peg them. So I, I left it at home, you're safe to fall asleep. So you could throw it, and these shepherds in that region could throw it with amazing speed and accuracy. They'd have contests, and, and there was just something, that if you were a shepherd, you were accurate with your rod. It was their main weapon of defense. In fact, the rod was an extension of the shepherd's right arm the symbol of his strength and his power and his authority. And so the rod was how the shepherd safeguarded himself and the flock in those summer months in particular. So interestingly enough, this club was also used to discipline or correct any wayward sheep that insisted on wandering away. They, they would take those knob berries and the, if there was a sheep misbehaving, they would just hurl it at it. And, and so the, the sheep, if, if they were wandering away, getting close to danger, maybe a poisonous weed, they could throw it. A club would go whistling through the air and stop the sheep from great harm or even destruction. And so I've been hit by a few of these in my Christian life, and I'm sure some of you could testify as well that there's this, this rod that God will use to keep us away from dangers and on the path of, of the Christian life. Another use of the rod was they would actually use it to count the sheep and they would examine them. They would lift up, you know, all of the, their uh, wool. And so they were routinely counted and looked over by the shepherd to make sure that all was well, no injuries that were not spotted. And so they, they would part the wool to make sure there were no injuries or any conditions of the skin and make sure no disease. It's that phrase you've heard, I had to pull the wool over your eyes. And so they had to make sure that there was nothing wrong with the sheep. So the, kind of like the psalmist in Psalm 139, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and then lead me in the everlasting <coughs> way. Excuse me. So uh, most important use of the rod, though, was for protection. It was a, a defense and a deterrent from attacks. And I think this is why it would comfort a sheep so much is because I'm protected. Your, your rod protects me. The rod is in the shepherd's hand. He was ever ready to protect his sheep from animals and rustlers and poisonous weeds. It, it was always a, a sign that I'm protected by the right hand of Almighty God. And so when we consider this in our psalm, the Lord then is my shepherd, I shall not want. We see then that we have a good, a good shepherd who will protect us from our enemies. And we have many. All, all hell is set against us when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. And our good shepherd is who? Our good shepherd, we saw, is God Almighty. The infinite, almighty, sovereign God is our shepherd, and He has a rod to protect us. His right hand protects His flock and His sheep. Amen? You are protected by the Almighty Shepherd that brings a soul to rest, as we will see a little later in verse 5. But one last thought that I, I love as well about this rod, it's what the hymn writer said, as we are prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We're, we're sheep. That's what John was sharing. And we, we turn to our own way and we go down the wrong path. And the rod comes flying across the field at us, and it bumps us back onto the right path. He turns us back so that He can lead us into the paths of righteousness. I will, I will turn you with my rod from the wrong path to get you back on the right path. He disciplines those He loves, does He not? He will discipline. If you are not disciplined, you're not His sheep. You're an illegitimate child. Is that a comfort to you this morning? I love it because I would wander and make absolute shipwreck of my life without a God and a shepherd like this. That rod comforts me. Thank you, Lord, for disciplining me back 
and to the peaceful fruit of righteousness. If I didn't have that, I would go astray and I would get on those wrong paths and never come back. So it comforts me that there is a shepherd who is always disciplining me back on to the right path. I can't just run off into sin and destroy my life. I have a shepherd who will stop that. Praise God. I bet there would be 500 testimonies this morning of people who would say, God has done that very thing in my life. As an earthly shepherd, I've watched him do it in many of your lives here this morning. He does it every time to his true sheep. It's why the Puritan said the worst affliction of all is not to be afflicted. The worst, I, I would fear if God didn't afflict me. And because he does, it comforts my soul. This is like a child who says, thanks, I needed that when they've been disciplined. Uh, Robin Conwell shared uh, last week, I think it was, a, a child who hugs you after you discipline them. They, they, they want to be comforted. Thy rod, it, it comforts me, it restores me, it's a part of this whole process. When I was a parent, I'd always get these weird ideas, and I'm always trying new things, and I remember the one time I wanted to teach them uh, something, and one of my sons did something really bad, and he, he really needed a severe discipline, and we established why it needed to be punished. And then I said, here, here's the rod of discipline. Now your dad's going to bend over and you're going to hit me as hard as you can with this rod of discipline to teach him the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. Well, I had a son one day who was being stubborn and rebellious, if any parents could picture that. Um, and we finally just said, you know what, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to, I'm, I'm not, you won't listen to me then. There's going to be no more discipline and correction. Uh, when we have family worship, uh, I'm going to have you go down to your room. And all of a sudden, they begin to realize, wait a minute, I, I want that. Uh, they, they were begging for discipline and for nurture. There was just a, a soul. I love my father's discipline. It comforts me truly. And so every one of our hearts should, I love that there's a father who shepherds me and disciplines me and corrects me. This is a gift. It should comfort every soul here this morning. So please understand the analogy. God doesn't throw a knob carry at you just to hurt you. Do, you. do you know that? He would never throw that at you just to hurt you. Never. No discipline, the writer of Hebrews says, seems pleasant at the time, but difficult. And so this rod can hurt. It can bring some very difficult seasons to your life. But God is never hurting you, fellow sheep, just to hurt you. He is correcting you by leading you to the paths of righteousness and safety. And so I want you to love a God who disciplines his children. Embrace the rod of discipline in your life. It's a blessing and it's a sign of love to be disciplined by the shepherd. I shall not want. My shepherd will protect me and he will discipline me when I wander from the fold of God. Secondly, thy staff. Can you think of anything that identifies a shepherd more than a staff? You know, whenever you see a shepherd, he's always got the staff. There, there's no other occupation that carries a, a staff. Does it, kids, do you ever see your dad get up in the morning with a briefcase and a staff walking out the door? It's just, it's the flat out symbol of a shepherd. We used to, I think we used to have it on our logo even. It, it was a sign of a staff, of, of, a, of a shepherd. And so the staff was used for the care and the management of the sheep. It was a symbol of concern. It really was a, a picture of the compassion of the shepherd. It was there for their comfort. It was a long stick, of course, with the crook at the end of it. And, and it symbolized comfort and care and gentle correction. It's really a picture of the Holy Spirit, the gracious spirit. I learned this week from Philip Keller there are three areas that these staffs were used for. One was to draw the sheep into intimate relationship. <coughs> and it was used, this, this was really interesting, it was used to lift a newborn sheep. When they would be birthed, they would take the staff to bring it back to the mother because if the shepherd would touch the sheep, the, the mom could possibly reject the baby because of the odor now of, of a human. So it's, it's a touching sight to watch, he said, this beautiful tenderness of taking a newborn and bringing it to its mother. 
as well, the shepherd would draw his sheep close with the, the staff to inspect him. And the staff would help with a timid sheep who would try to get away from the shepherd, and, and he would use it to draw him in close. And so there's a real intimacy with the staff. Next, it was used as well to guide the sheep as they would walk along new paths or maybe dangerous ones that we learned last week. He, he would guide them in the right path with that shepherd's staff, and he would do it kindly. The rod you might have to throw, but the staff was this, always this gentle guiding and correcting and bringing back into the right place. And thirdly, the shepherd sometimes when they were walking, this is interesting, he, would, he could just hold it against the side of the sheep while they were walking, and he says, it was almost like you're walking hand in hand with the sheep. And so it was a very comforting thing to the sheep just to even have the shepherd touch them with his staff as they would walk to their new places. John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you, he will shepherd you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He'll reveal to you the words of Christ and truth and where all of this is coming. So I love it that the Spirit will guide you into all truth. We have the Spirit. We have a, a trinity of a shepherd. We have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit working and guiding and shepherding us. And so I just want to make sure that, that you're, you're getting that from this psalm. The Christian life is not just ascribing to some doctrines. I fight some of you weekly on this. I did that. I did that passionately and laboriously to understand and know every doctrine that I could ever lay hold and learn, and I still do. But I remember a day, I've shared this before, but a, a trial hit very deep into my life, and I, I sat outside one day, and I was really broken. And, and finally, I had to be honest and finally admit to myself that, God, I don't think I really trust you. It, it was just all of a sudden, there was such anxiety. And I had taught the attributes of God three times, and I knew every attribute and every truth about Him, but somewhere I missed along the way of letting these attributes lead me to God to trust Him, to love Him, and to trust Him. I was just stopping at the truth of the doctrine. And Psalm 23 is, is a corrective for those who are just stopping with the truth, and it's not getting you to the shepherd. You're coming short of the blessing that God has for His children. And so this is a call to learn truth, but so that I may know Him, that I might trust Him, that I might love Him, that I might obey Him. I want to know His touch and His Spirit upon my spirit. I want to sense the Comforter at my side, that He's leading you in the most simple and intimate of details in your life. He can be relied upon in every decision you make. He's a near God. He wants this relationship of shepherd and sheep. That is what John shared this morning. God took him from all of that to bring him close and near. I want you, John, to be my little lamb. I want you to live and trust and quit living with anxiety that you've got to take care of yourself and all these little subtle things that have been affecting your whole life. Oh, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so I just want to ask you this morning, do they comfort you? Is that just nice poetry to you? Are you finding any comfort from these things? Are you beginning to lie down in green pastures? We, we live in one of the hardest days and ages of just constant bombardment of data. And as a, as a flock, we have got to learn how to, how to lay down in green pastures with God and how to rest and how to trust. And we're going to have to shut things off and turn them, turn them and push them away. You're not going to be able to keep up with all the movies and all those things and be a sheep that lives into this kind of stuff that we're learning. Are you finding comfort? That is what a good shepherd wants for his sheep. He wants you to lie down contented in his hand and not be the anxious and the worried. This is the fruit. This is the application of our whole Christian life. Are we learning it? Are we getting it? I pray that that's what God's doing in your heart so you don't need a heart attack at age 34. Look with me in verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
Several commentators feel now that David now switches from a sheep analogy to a banquet analogy, but I don't think the text demands that, and I don't think that's what David is doing. He definitely is bringing in some banquet pictures, but I think this is still in the context of sheep and a shepherd. The whole psalm is packaged, and the Lord is my shepherd, and at the end I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever as a contented sheep. This is about sheep, and this is about their shepherd. And so David is drawing out some beautiful banquet ideas for us as his sheep. But just a few men, uh, Don Carson, J.I. Packer, Sinclair Ferguson, just listening to some of those men this week, they draw out some beautiful thoughts on the continuing understanding of the sheep and their shepherd. They don't believe David's fleeing away from that uh, idea either. And so let's take a look at this beautiful phrase then that is before us preparing a table in the presence of my enemies. There's a couple ideas I came across this week. First, the shepherd, he built tables. They were just a little bit lifted and the food would be on them. And the reason it would avoid the parasites from the ground that would get in. And so the parasites are the enemies and you prepare a table as a possibility. But I lean more toward the other aspect of shepherding that was very common at this time in the psalm that we've been tracing in the yearly cycle of a life of a sheep. And so as the sheep approach the high mountain country that we looked at last week, they are now beginning to go up there. They're, they're going to go up, though, and, and they're on these tablelands called mesas. Uh, I grew up in a place called Table Mountain, and it just was this, it looked like a big old table. And so the table could be the mountain the place that the shadow of the valley of death would lead to. It would take you up to higher ground, and that's where the good shepherd is taking his sheep. And what would happen here is that the shepherd then, he would go several times before the season where he would lead the sheep to the higher ground, and he would go up there and inspect the land and make sure that it was ready for the sheep before he actually took them up there. And then right before making the trek, he would take salt and minerals, and he would go up there and prepare it. And he would clear all of the poisonous weeds from that area. And he would spend days going over the ground and just plucking out every poisonous plant. And this was done every spring before the sheep would come up. (coughs) Excuse me. This was very tough and tedious and tiring with all the bending and and all of that. Any any of you ever pulled weeds? Every time I do, I'm sore for two weeks just in in the hamstrings. And so picture the the tediousness of pulling all those weeds and getting it all ready. And this is what they would call preparing a table in the presence of my enemies. David would go up and he would walk around slowly over the summer range. And he would look for the poisonous weeds and he would prepare the land for his flock. The other thing the shepherd would do in preparing the tables then for, for the mesas for his flock, he would look for signs of wolves, coyotes, cougars, and bears, and even drive them out. And so those that were ready then to pounce on the sheep, uh, only the alertness of the shepherd can save them. And he would he try to go and prepare this ground even for the enemies and in, in, in protection over the sheep, uh, cutting back bushes and everything that he would need to do to not give dangerous places for those sheep. Thirdly, he would clear out all the water holes in the springs that got leaves and twigs and stones and soil that fell there during the winter. And so this was all a part of the preparation of the table for his sheep in the summer. And so what's the takeaway maybe for us as God's sheep? How does he prepare a table for us in the midst of our enemies? Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that we're in a battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of the darkness. We're in a a horrible battle against uh, the devil and his cohorts. We have so many enemies. We have the devil, we have the world system, and it's people that hate the people of God, and we've got remaining flesh that is against us. So we, we have so many who want to destroy us, yet we have one who became man and he walked among us. And he was subjected to all of these enemies. He was acquainted with grief and sorrow. And our enemies unleashed on the Son of God like no other. And he learned much so that now he's able to be a sympathetic high priest to us. He's come to earth and he walked the territory before us and he prepared a table for us right in the midst of our enemies. 
This is not live in fear or be paralyzed all of your days with so many dreadful and real enemies. There's something so sweet that the Good Shepherd has done for us in preparing a table for us. The battle belongs to the Lord. If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, I just said all hell is against us. Who could be against us? But they, uh, Paul writing that means who can be against us and really hurt us? Who can ever thwart God's will? So we have enemies on every turn, but who can really be against us if the good shepherd is for us? So in midst of all these enemies, there's a sweet place called the table that's been prepared for us in the midst of all of our enemies by the Lord Jesus Christ. No one can truly harm you. And so in the midst of all of our enemies, which are many, last week even death, I want you to hear that. He's prepared a table for you. We have a safe place. We can be at peace even in the midst of all of our enemies. We're safe. In the midst of all the chaos in this world, there are enemies on every side. The world hates us, and it's like this common grace in America is being lifted, and the, the enmity and the nastiness is growing, and the hostility is coming. And we can be those who are not rattled and falling apart like we see all around us but we're having a banquet right in the midst of them. He has prepared a table for us right in the midst of our enemies. The Psalms are just filled with David surrounded by enemies. And he's at peace because the Lord, he says, is my portion. The Lord is my strength. He's my strong tower. He's my shepherd. This is what is available to God's sheep. Tranquility and peace even in the midst of all of our enemies. I think of Peter in the midst of all of his enemies. Jesus said, Peter, Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. you. You will not fall prey to your enemy. He will not destroy you. I have prepared a table for you, Peter. I intercede on your behalf. I have a safe place for you. My question is, how did our good shepherd prepare a safe place for us? Well, the personal cost of Christ the good shepherd, to prepare a table for his own in the midst of our enemies, it was very great. The shepherd had to give a great sacrifice for the sheep to prepare those table mesas. But none like what the good shepherd had to do to prepare a table for us. For Christ, it was the agony of Gethsemane. It was the mock trial and the abuse and the friends leaving and departing and then finishing the Calvary road as he hung on a cross. It cost our good shepherd much to prepare this table for us. But now because our enemies unleashed everything they had on Jesus Christ that day, they were defeated. They were absolutely defeated, even death. And now I can sit in the presence of my enemies and I have a buffet. I can feed on Christ. I'm safe. I have everything right in the midst of my enemies because he, for, he, he lost everything. He had every one of those enemies come at him at full bear. I could not help but to think of the Lord's table. I'm sure some of your hearts have already gone there. The feast and the celebration of His great love and sacrifice for us. The cost to prepare a table for me. No greater love than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. What he left, what he left, he had all of the glories of heaven, perfect communion and fellowship with the Father and the, and the Spirit. He left the, the, the most perfect place and, and where you could ever be. And he came and he received absolute rejection, abuse, and death on a cross. This is love to help sheep who are unable to help themselves and to bring you into the fold of God. So guys, if we would believe this truth that God has proclaimed to us, the Lord is my shepherd. With all of my enemies seeking to destroy me, He's made a table for me to feed upon Him and to be satisfied in Christ, to be content and to be safe and to be blessed and, and to rest, to rest in the midst of everything going around me because I have this table that's been prepared for me by the Good Shepherd. It just feels so good as I watch the enemies being allowed to rage more and more in our day and age, and it's just so sweet what God, the Good Shepherd, has done for us. I need to close out with one more reality. Uh, 
um, why I don't want. And the last one is that he's anointed my head with oil. And this one I'm going to do real quickly because I'm out of time. Uh, and I, I hit on it earlier during Green Pastures. And so this is the fears and the nuisances that need to be taken care of in our life. The Good Shepherd has just taken care of everything I shall not want. So what does this mean? Well, here are the sheep. They've come through the valley of the shadow of death. The shepherd was with them through the hardest time of their life. They're just blessed. They're the happiest saints I've ever seen when they come out of these seasons. And you're just, you're in green pastures. You're in still waters. And there's a table before your enemies. Everything's good. And then there's a fly in your ointment. Summertime is fly time. And they emerge in the warm weather. And you get all kinds of insects now. And it was a serious problem for the sheep. And so um, there were warble flies, bot flies, heel flies, nasal flies, deer flies, black flies, mosquitoes, gnats, other parasites. That is now what would be the temptation in this summer. It can turn those golden summer months now into a time of torture. If a nose fly, it would buzz around the sheep's head and, and they would deposit their eggs in a moist place, which was the sheep's nose. They would hatch and they would go up their head and literally drive them crazy. And it would bring severe irritation and inflammation. And for relief, they would beat their heads against trees and rocks and posts and brush. I've counseled people in that place. And in severe cases, they give up. And so sheep, they run from them. They shake their heads for hours. And when this happens, the sheep quit gaining weight and they get unhealthy now, even after making it through the shadow of the valley. And so when a shepherd sees flies, what he would do is he would, he would anoint their nose and their head with oil. It was a, a linseed oil, sulfur, sulfur, and tar, and they would put it on the nose and head, and it would instantly, they said, change their behavior, almost instantly. The aggravation and the frenzy and the irritability are just gone, and then they would lie down in peaceful contentment. So what does this mean as a child of God? Again, a sheep in God's pasture this is truly important to our peace and contentment because it's the simple irritations of life that end up getting us. They're the ones that tend to, the, the, those small petty annoyances can begin to ruin my calm. And I, I just, they irritate me. And all of a sudden, I just feel not at rest because of all these little things. Raising small children. Right, moms? Dads? How about a coach who's ugly to your kid? And they're hurting them so deep you can't sleep, writing the letter in your head, uh, picturing letting the air out of his tires and all those things. <coughs> a person at work who's trying to make themselves better than you. This has is, this is destroyed marriages, a toilet seat left up. An inconsiderate neighbor. A child who does not learn what you want them to. A dog that eats any food that's not watched and goes to the bathroom on your carpet and your pillow. A teenager. <laughs> My dad used to always say, you can always tell a teenager, but not much. <laughs> Driving in snow. People not having it all together like you. Criticisms, rush hour. I hope you get the picture. It's at these times that the dripping faucet, the constant flies of life, because this is not paradise, they can undo us. I need the renewed application of oil. The anointing of God's gracious Spirit, the Holy Spirit, can give us the attitudes of Jesus Christ. And to live in this psalm, to let the shepherd lead you away from these irritants, to God, anoint my head with oil, uh, refresh me, let it go away, come to the early dew of the Word again. George Mueller said, I read the Word until my soul was sweetened on Christ. I wouldn't quit reading until that happened. That's anointing. He can help us with our aggravations and our annoyances to handle them with quietness and calmness. It's available. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Standing firm in your freedom in Jesus Christ. Staying in the glorious gospel. Staying in this psalm. There can be a beautiful place where the, the shepherd can anoint your head with oil. And these nuisances, you can begin to, to not be dad's touchy and, and grumpy. And, and you can begin to be a peaceful person who can endure these little nuisances that come and the flies of life. And so don't, don't be characterized by the crotchety, lemon-sucking, gnarly dude, Christian. Don't, don't be that. There's something beautiful that the Good Shepherd can bring 
uh, to just put on display his work with his sheep. So when people or circumstances are beyond our control, it tends to bug us and frustrate us. And so can you be content right in that place? By the Spirit of God, we don't have to be irritable, grumpy, negative, and condescending. When I'm that way, I know the problem is with me and my heart. When everybody starts bugging me, it's me. It needs to be sweetened on what the Holy Spirit reveals to us, Jesus Christ. Bring whatever is annoying to you and say, Jesus, I can't cope with this. Could shepherd anoint my head with oil from all these flies? Let me act and react as you would in these situations and how quickly he will answer that. I remember when I'd come home from church when my kids were really young, a long, hard day, counseling, dealing with problems, and I just felt so exhausted and ready to crash. And I would sit in my garage and I would pray as long as it took till my spirit was sweetened to come in and love those kids and minister till I went to bed. And just, Spirit, sweeten it back up. Bring me back to that place to be a minister for you to my family. So I pray that we would be the most contented people on the face of the earth. And, and he says, therefore, your cup overflows. I, I have an abundance, uh, pressed down, overflowing, the abundant grace. He's full of grace and truth, layers and layers. All, there's just, it overflows with abundance of all that God has given to me by him being my shepherd. I, I have the Lord as my shepherd. God has made it. So I don't just survive, I thrive. And so I pray that we're learning these sweet things in Psalm 23. Come back next week, and if the Lord wills, we will finish up Psalm 23 with a great blessing and encouragement. So I had to kind of fly this morning. <laughs> That's a bad joke, fly. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, close in prayer, and then we'll worship together. Father, I thank you so much for being a good shepherd. Thank you for uh, a rod and a staff. God, I thank you that you have ministered to every heart here so deeply by leading us away and disciplining us out of those things that would harm and destroy us. I thank you for the tenderness of your shepherd's crook. God, that you walk and hold it against our side and have fellowship with us on the journey. God, we rejoice in that beauty and I love the table that you have laid for us in the midst of our enemies. God, there are enemies surrounding us everywhere, and yet we don't need to fear because you're our God. Surely you'll help us, and surely you'll uphold us with your righteous right hand. If you're for us, who could be against us? God, let us, let us eat at this buffet in the midst of our enemies because of what Christ has done. He has conquered all of our enemies, even the last one of death. God, we thank you for the good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. God, we thank you that you anoint our heads with oil, that we can walk in a contented peacefulness, even with all the little irritations of the fall that have come into this world and into our lives. God, our, our cup overflows. We have everything in you. There is such an abundance. I praise you, and we give you all the glory and thanks this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.